Good evening. Welcome to each of you. Are you ready to travel? Well, I am as well. Now, if you'll fasten your seat belts and relax, we shall be on our way to the city of Rome. We're going to be visiting Rome on several occasions. We've said on more than one occasion we've visited other cities that the major cities of the world are built on the banks of a river. And it's true here, the river that runs through the city of Rome is the Tiber. Now we're going to get in a helicopter and lift up from the banks of the Tiber and have a panoramic view of the city. And we see the many, many domes of the various Roman Catholic cathedrals. I've forgotten how many there are. There was a time a long while back that there was a necessity of cathedrals because every cardinal that makes up the College of Cardinals, the governing body of the church beneath the Pope himself, every cardinal had to be a pastor ex officio or in name only of one of the cathedrals inside the city of Rome. Well, now the College of Cardinals has outgrown the number of um, cathedrals, but we're going to look at some in a close-up tonight, beginning with the Cathedral of St. Paul outside the gate. The Apostle Paul spent his last days here in the city of Rome down in a hole called the Mamertine. He was left in there to die, but they couldn't wait for his demise. They took him out and brought him over and beheaded him. And in the early part of the fourth century, they built a church on the supposed site of the death of the Apostle Paul. And a few years later then, they tore that one down and replaced it with this one that's been standing for such a long, long time. By the way, the facade up there contains the largest mosaic piece of art in the world. At least that is the claim. I think we've said on prior occasions that during the Dark Ages, the Bibles were chained to monastery desks. They were for the private interpretation of church leadership. Therefore, in order to teach the folks the Bible stories, they would decorate the cathedrals with Bible art maybe a sculpting, maybe a painting, maybe a stained glass window. And here on the exterior, it happens to be this huge mosaic that is covered with Bible story. Now, the style of architecture that we're going to see largely tonight is Romanesque. Several evenings ago, we went inside a cathedral over in London, and we said that the style there was Gothic. Gothic is delicate and slender and spaghetti-thin, and Romanesque is just the reverse of that. It is bold and stout and big pillars and broad arches. And so this is the Romanesque style. A true cathedral had to be built in the shape of a cross. And if this auditorium were a cathedral, where you folks are seated would be the nave, the main nave traditionally. And then at the point of the high altar, there is an arm that goes out in either direction, and that is called the transept. And behind that, behind the high altar, a little alcove called the apse to symbolize the head part of a cross. So nave, transept, and apse. And we're standing to take this picture, of course, at the end of the nave, looking down toward the high altar. We look up into the ceiling, we see that it's hand carved out of beautiful hardwood, and then it is covered over with the gold leaf. And in the very center of the ceiling is the coat of arms of the Pope that was reigning at the time of the dedication, the papal coat of arms. Mass is about to begin, and we look up above the high altar and we see again paintings and mosaics telling the Bible story. They're telling about Jesus discipling his followers, Peter, James, John, Andrew, the others. That means teaching them, discipling, and then beneath that, his apostling them, sending them out to share what he has taught. This is a marble statue after whom the cathedral is named the Apostle Paul. Paul called himself the Apostle to the Gentiles. He believed that it was his mission to take the good news of Jesus now beyond Judaism and out to the rest of the world. And so he would go on mission journeys all through Asia Minor and as far away as Rome. And you remember from his last letter, he said, if I get out of here, talking about jail, if I get out of this situation, I have Spain in mind. And I'll tell you what, 
I've been to 62 countries of the world and I preached in many and I've been to about all of the states to preach and if Jesus doesn't hurry back, I have Spain in mind. How about you? Now yeah, we've got to take the gospel everywhere. We must do that. And now I've taken you outside to show you something that gives this cathedral its real personality. I didn't bring you here to the Rose Garden to show you the flowers, though they are lovely. I brought you here to show you the colonnade. I've forgotten how many columns and arches there are, and that's really unimportant. What I do well remember is each of those columns is different from every other one. Some are round, some are square, some are octagonal, some are serpentine, but each one is different from the other. We're now standing with our backs to the Tiber River, and in the very center of our picture is the dome of the largest cathedral in the world. That is St. Peter's inside the Vatican. We shall not go in there tonight, but we shall on two subsequent evenings. But I wanted you to notice this building that's over on the extreme right. It has two names. It's known as the Castle of the Holy Angel. And way up at the top, there you see a bronze of an angel. We're going to stand up there soon. But it's also known as the Tomb of Hadrian. Roman Emperor Hadrian wanted to be buried inside this place. He'd ordered its construction. It was built as a safe house, ladies and gentlemen. And it was defended at every level. You look at that building and look at its construction, and you see that at each tower there is a cantilever with an arch. And that, as we've talked on other evenings, was for the purpose of pouring down hot oil upon anyone, anyone trying to break inside. And there were other ancient weapons, as we're going to notice as we go higher and higher. And so the Emperor Hadrian, who, by the way, was really an enemy of Jesus and of Christianity, he may have been, well, along with, um, with a madman by the name of Nero, he may have been the worst enemy of the church that history has ever known. So let's move across the bridge and have a close-up. Look at the very various levels there, and, and all of them have that overhang, and we're going to then pay our fee and go inside. From the second level, we look back down into the courtyard and we see cannon, and that tells us that this was used as a fort at a much later date than Hadrian's, of course, time of modern weaponry. And then we go further still, and we look up, and there's our buddy, and there's that cantilever, and uh, where he's standing, there is one of the openings. At every level, it could be defended by throwing things down through or by pouring down hot water or hot oil upon anyone trying to break in. Now we see an ancient relic, an old war machine. <clears throat> there is the catapult, and you see a stack of those great big watermelon-sized stones, and it has two in the ladle, and that thing was cocked, and it would throw those rocks out over to the outside against any army that might be gathered there. In addition, there was a whole room filled with grapefruit-sized balls for the purpose of throwing by hand. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these stones perfectly rounded so that they could have fair accuracy and then thrown by hand. I've thought about it, ladies and gentlemen. You know, if you got hit with one of those, you're going to need one of those aspirins like they show on TV, about like that. <laughs> An aspirin sandwich, at least. Well, we're up near the top now, and we're looking over the wall inside the Vatican. Vatican is 111 acres inside the city of Rome, and as I mentioned, we shall visit there on subsequent evenings. I'm going to put the camera out through that opening and put on the wide-angle lens and give you a view of something that I find fascinating. There is an interesting sidewalk. It's about 25 feet above the street level. There you see it, and I'm going to trace it across from the bottom right hand of the screen. You begin there, and that is inside this castle now, inside this place of safety, and it goes all the way through the wall inside the Vatican and all the way over to the Pope's house. How about that? If the Pope's life was in danger, this, you know, after the empire of the Caesars, during the Holy Roman time, and later uh, the empire of the papacy, if the Pope's life was in danger, he could leave his house without uh, walking down on the streets where enemies might be. He could uh, find safety by running over here inside this place of Hadrian. Well, 
there are many other things to see. And so we're from the very top, standing beneath the holy angel, going to bid adieu and move across town. This building, ladies and gentlemen, is the Pantheon. And I want to tell you a little bit about that name. The name Pantheon is taken from two New Testament words or Greek words. Pan means all. Pan American Airlines, the airline that flew across all the Americas. Pan, all. And then Theon or Theos is the word for God, the Greek word for God. This for hundreds of years, folk, was the place where the pagans came to worship the gods of the sun and the moon and the stars and Mercury, the messenger god, and a host of others. The place of worshiping all of the pagan gods. Christianity, born over in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus and the disciples, began by the second and third centuries to sweep across the Roman world like fire in dry brush. And one by one, pagan temples became Christian churches. And this is one example. Today, you see out in front of it this obelisk, and that is from Heliopolis, the north of the continent of Africa. Helios is one of the pagan names of the sun god. And there we see a big gold ball to symbolize the sun. And atop that, we see a cross to give further evidence, archaeological evidence, and, um, and, and historical proof of the melding together of Christianity with elements of the religion that was prior to Christianity to a large degree. And that was paganism. We're going to go inside, and we're going to see something immediately at the rooftop. By the way, this building was built in the 6th century, and it is for you carpenters' sake, you builders, this was one of the very earliest uses of concrete. And they had a pretty good mix, didn't they, huh? I don't know if it was a five or six bag mix, but it held up well, that's for certain. Yeah, a concrete dome. And the thing is huge, and nearly all of the great domes in the world today are fashioned after the design of this one. And some of them still are made out of concrete. Well, you will notice a hole in the ceiling. That hole is about 30 feet in diameter, ladies and gentlemen. And that was so that at certain times of the year, they could see the sun or the moon or the stars and enjoy that in their worship of paganism. Now, if you're wondering what happens when it rains, the answer is very simple. The rainwater came right in. But beneath that opening, there are holes drilled in the floor. And at the very center of the floor is slightly concave. It's saucered. And the rainwater uh, drains right down through the holes and into the drainage system down beneath. There is a pipe organ in here set back amidst those beautiful, beautiful marble pillars. And when I was here on one occasion, the maestro played. And when those notes reverberated off of that round marble building, it was indeed magic. We're going to pause very briefly at the tomb of Raphael. Raphael is buried right there. Well, we've moved now to another cathedral, and this one, again, is very obviously of the Romanesque style. Big columns and, and uh, wide and broad arches. And there is the high altar. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the cathedral of San Pietro di Vincoli, or we perhaps would say St. Peter in chains. The Apostle Paul came to Rome and was martyred. He was beheaded. The Apostle Peter came to Rome. And some early historians say that he was kept also in the Mamertine hole or the Mamertine prison cave. We can't be certain of that, but we are quite certain Paul was. But in any event, Peter was taken and executed on a cross. And he said, I don't deserve to die like my Lord. They said, fine then. And so they hung him on an inverted cross, hung him upside down and left him to die in that position. And so they show you all kinds of relics here, like this one inside the bronze case, this old, old link chain and they'll tell you here that this is the chain the very absolute chain that peter was chained with when he was a prisoner here in the city of rome i think that some of these ideas we have to take with more than a grain of salt yes uh, maybe a teaspoon or two but they're put here for the purpose of reminding folks of the mission of the church and i have no problem 
uh, with being reminded of the mission of the church as far as that's concerned, as long as folks don't begin to worship uh, those kinds of things or any such as that. Well, nearby, there is a nail, and they will tell you that this old spike was the one that was driven through the feet of Jesus when he was nailed to the cross. The cathedral of San Pietro e Vincoli, St. Peter in Chains. Here, then, is a statue in this cathedral of the first of the Roman emperors to claim to be a Christian. This, of course, was Constantine. Constantine was a Christian as a result of a political necessity. I think that's the fairest and most honest way to say it. To think that he was born again would be more than a misnomer, a mistaken idea. When Constantine came to power, he inherited an empire that was divided right down the center. Paganism had been the religion of the masses for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But in recent times, Christianity was born in Jerusalem and spread like a wildfire driven by a fierce Santa Ana wind. He saw the possibility, yes, the probability of the empire being split and being politically savvy. Constantine went down to a cathedral that we're going to visit and said to the pastor, I want to be a Christian. I want to be baptized. And so the pastor, unable, I suppose, to say no to the emperor, took him into the baptistry and immersed him beneath the water. Now, when Constantine came up out of the water, he did not come up a born-again Christian, but really a barely diluted, barely watered-down pagan. But from that point on, he began to promote Christianity. He said, I'm a Christian, and if any of you do a Christian harm, I'm going to take it personally. If I hear that anyone has uh, taken the life of a Christian, I'm going to react in the same way as if you had tried to take my own life. I am a Christian. I want everyone to be Christian. But then he said at a great church meeting, Christians, we can't have it all our way. The basic teaching of Christianity is to love everyone and to be open-minded. And so he said, we are going to meet the pagans in the middle of the road. And he, at this great church council, brought into the Christian church many, many teachings and practices that had been used by the pagans in the prior centuries. And as the result of the influence of the baptism of Constantine, a great deal of paganism was brought into the church, and a lot of it is still around today, as we've mentioned on other evenings, and we'll continue to do so as we study further. The statue of Constantine, and, uh, and I think it's rightly placed. Now we've come to the cathedral that is the, the church of the Pope. And I say that again with the idea of um, ex officio. We would traditionally think that St. Peter's inside the Vatican is the Pope's church, but that's not the case. St. Peter's is only ever Peter's church. This is the cathedral of St. John's Lateran, and it is this cathedral that the Pope is pastor of, but again, in name only. Again, the architecture inside is Romanesque. So we'll step inside and have a little view down the main nave. The high altar is unique in all of the world because it has two statues in it. And so we're going to go down toward them. And I'm going to use my pointer. And I'm going to show you right up there. There they are. They're made out of brass. And they claim here that inside these statues are the remains of the bodies of Peter and Paul. Now, over inside the Vatican, they say, no, Peter is buried beneath the high altar here, but, but the folks over here disagree. I think God only knows where Peter sleeps. But this is a beautiful, beautiful cathedral, more lovely in many ways than some of the others that we have looked at. And you just, again, have to be impressed, deeply impressed, by the beauty of the architecture and be reminded that this was done by men with crude and ancient tools by our standards of today. Now, separate and apart from the church, but a part of the church complex is the baptistry, and this is it. I'm standing in it, and it was down in the center where Constantine was baptized. We're going to talk tomorrow evening about baptism and its place and its importance in the church, so be sure that you're here to travel with me when we go to Pisa. You may recall that last night I gave you a bit of a warning I said that tonight 
we were going to go to cathedrals and we were also going to go into a church where, uh, where it's a little scary. You recall that? Remember I told you I'd give you a fair warning that if you had a problem with nightmares or bad dreams or any such thing, I'd tell you when to close your eyes. Well, the time is now. All right? And uh, by the way, don't do it this way. I've seen, fo- it doesn't work. I've seen folks do that. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, is the mother church of the Capuchin order. And over here, they say cappuccini, cappuccini. Does that sound like anything that we know about here in this, in our environment? You go into Starbucks and for $5, you can buy yourself a cup of cappuccino, cappuccino. Where did cappuccino get its name? Well, they say it was taken from the color of the robes of the capuchin monks. And we're going to see some of that in a little bit. Now, it's not what's up on the main floor in the main nave that we want to see, but rather what's in the basement. So if you have your courage up, go into the basement with me. When the capuchin monks, the monks who serve here die, their remains are immediately cleaned up, their bones are scraped, and they're stacked with the leg bones in one area and the backbones in another area and certain other bones in another area and skull bones. And when you visit here, you're going to want to go in the daylight, I'm sure of that. And every time I look at this picture, I'm reminded of Mark Twain. He was such a character. Samuel Clemens... His nom de plume or his pen name, of course, was Mark Twain. He was working for the St. Louis Dispatch newspaper at the time of the first steam-powered crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. And his newspaper said to him, Mr. Twain, we will pay your way and buy your food and all. We'll send you on this crossing, this big side paddle wheeler across the Atlantic. And you write back, you write us letters, and we'll print the letters. And so he took them up on that bargain. And those letters now are in a book entitled Innocence Abroad. And Mark Twain came to Rome, and he went into the basement of this church, and he stood where we're standing now, and then he wrote back and said, Not a place I care to be, I think, when Gabriel blows his horn. And the knee bone connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone connected to the hip bone. You can see it in your mind, can't you? He was just a crazy guy, that Mark Twain. Well, we must hurry now. Our final church is this one. If it's not the oldest church in the city, it is second. There's some dispute about all of that. That's not important to us tonight. This is the Church of St. Clement, dating back to the earliest records of Christianity in the city of Rome. And again, it's not what's here in the worship area that we want to see, but rather what's in the basement. In the basement, we see stone benches, and in the middle of that, we see a statue with a carving in the marble of the god Mithra. Mithra was part and parcel of sun worship and Sunday keeping. Here, ladies and gentlemen, we have a church one of the oldest in the city of Rome that was built up over the theological seminary, if you please, of pagan sun worship. And so when we say that Sunday observance and going to church on Sunday had its roots in paganism, it's not an unkind criticism. It's simply an archaeological and historical fact. That is really what happened. The highest god worshipped by the pagans was the sun. It was the sun that warmed the earth in the springtime and caused the grass to turn green again, caused fertility. And so along with that would come the worship of the moon, the moon goddess Ishtar, and Easter rabbits and Easter bunnies. Someone asked me just last night, how do we decide each year which Sunday is Easter Sunday? And the answer is very simple. It's always, since its origin, the first Sunday after the first full moon of the vernal equinox. The first Sunday after the first full moon of the spring. Did you ever wonder what connection the little Easter bunny and Easter eggs had with Jesus in the church? Fertility, right? The worshiping of the sexual powers of that little animal and, and the egg or the ovum. 
And so it's quite obvious that there are things in the Christian church not placed there by Jesus or any disciple. I want to thank you now for traveling with me. A few evenings back, I told you about going to work for Peggy's daddy in the logging camps when Peggy and I were newlyweds. Her daddy had a logging partner who was a Roman Catholic Christian and one of the finest gentlemen I have ever known. He was a wonderful man, a good example, and lived his belief. He was generous. He was honest to a fault. He was a hard worker. He was a wonderful husband. He was a wonderful father and one of the best friends I ever had. Not very long ago, he died in the Catholic hospital in Baker City, Oregon. I happened to be holding meetings similar to these in Le Grand. And so I would go every afternoon to visit Uncle Mickey. And in the last days, I went to visit him morning and evening. I partook of the emblems of the broken body of Jesus with him. I prayed with him, the Our Father. I talked to him about righteousness in Jesus and assured him of his place in heaven. When Uncle Mickey died, they asked me, and I understand it was his request, that I have a part in his funeral. It, of course, was in the Catholic Cathedral in Baker, Oregon. I was told later that it was the first time that a Protestant ever had stood and spoken at the high altar of the cathedral in Baker City, Oregon. Now, I tell you that story for this reason. God has his children in all of the churches. I've said that on many prior occasions. And I mean that to include the Roman Catholic Church. I plan to see Uncle Mickey in God's kingdom. If he followed all the truth that he understood, I know he will be there, and I believe he did that. Having said that, I want to say further that theologically, I have many, many differences with my Catholic Christian friends and family. That doesn't mean that I'm better or they're worse. It means that we are different. I have on occasion asked folks, what is your Christian background? And from time to time, folks will say to me, well, we're Protestant. And sometimes I have asked them, could you tell me what that means? And sometimes they say to me, well, that simply means, you know, that, that they're Catholics and they're Protestants, and, and we're Protestants. Luther and Calvin and Knox and Huss and Jerome and a host of others were given the name protestor because they were teaching and preaching against certain false teachings of the Church of Rome. They were protestors, and their followers and their disciples became known as Protestants. Protestants, at the outset, went by two rules. The Bible and the Bible only as our rule of faith and practice, and salvation by faith in the atoning merits of Jesus Christ alone. Sole scriptura, sole fide, the Bible only, and salvation by grace only. Last night, we learned that in the Bible, the Lord's Day is not Sunday, but rather it is Saturday. That the word Sabbath in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, always and without exception, means Saturday. To my mind, at least, the Bible teaching of the Sabbath or Saturday is as clear as is the plan of salvation or the plan of righteousness by faith. And a good while back, this thought came to me. What if, ladies and gentlemen, we were marooned individually on a desert island and we had no background of any religion? No Muslim, no Buddhism, no Christianity, no Protestantism, no Catholicism, nothing at all. We are on an island alone. And then one day there comes in the flotsam the strong box. It's watertight, and we open it up, and inside that box we find the captain's Bible. And we begin to read out of our sheer boredom at the outset from the Bible. And then we fall in love with the story 
and the plan of salvation and the author of salvation, our Lord Jesus. Would we believe that righteousness is by faith in Jesus? Surely we would. Would we believe that Jesus was coming back again? Absolutely we would. And which day would we believe was the Sabbath day? Which day? I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you couldn't arrive at any other conclusion except the Lord's day is Saturday. You couldn't believe anything different from that. It is so very, very clear. I'm going to read you at the outset tonight a quotation, and then we'll have a little bit of some talk, and then we're going to talk about other quotations, share other quotations. You'll forgive me for reading because these things are in quotations that are exact and precise, and I must be careful in that regard. I'm giving you a quotation now from St. Catherine's Parish Newsletter from May 21, 1995. Listen, perhaps the boldest thing and the most revolutionary thing that the Catholic Church ever did happened in the first century. That holy day, the Sabbath or Saturday, was changed from Saturday into Sunday, the day of the Lord, or Deus Domine. It was chosen not from any direction noted in the Scripture, but rather from the church's sense of its own power. People who think the Scriptures ought to be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists. And that's a direct quotation. There was a man who a while back wrote a book that he entitled The Protestant Dilemma. And I'm going to give you the short course, just a, a brief summation of this book. The thesis was this. We Protestants say and have always said we go by the Bible only and believe in salvation by grace and faith alone. But when it comes to the observance of a day and, and the going to church upon a day, we go on Sunday, a day about which there is nothing in the Bible. And when confronted, we have to make all kinds of lame excuses and, and give theological discussions that are really without merit and without base. And he said, when it comes then to this issue, it becomes this Protestant dilemma. It becomes this embarrassment because really, in this area particularly, we're not going by the Bible and the Bible only. Now, another quotation or two. This one from Henry Cardinal Newman, Archbishop of Baltimore. He says this, in the course of the fourth century, two new developments came across the face of Christendom. In order to recommend the new Christian religion to the heathen, there was transferred to Christianity the outward ornaments to which the pagans had been accustomed. Incense, lamps, candles, votive offerings, holy water, the use of images, and statues. All of these, he says, are of pagan origin. And he's exactly right. Any honest historian, whether Catholic, Protestant, or infidel, would tell you that same thing. As we noted during the travelogue, the pagans, for hundreds and hundreds of years, had worshipped the objects in the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars. There was Mercury, the messenger god. There was Ceres, the god of crops. And by the way, it's from that word we get our word cereal. And you remember that when in the morning you eat your Cheerios, won't you now? Huh? Of course you will. And then there was Vulcan, the god of fire. And from that idea and from that word we have our word vulcanize and volcano. My daughter called me from over the big island of Hawaii just this afternoon. And by the way, that girl has called Peggy and me every day since her brother died. Every day. just want to tell you I love you and today she'd been looking at the great volcano and it's pouring its molten lava into the sea again volcano vulcanized from the god Vulcan and a host of gods but the largest body worshipped by the pagans was the Sun for it was the largest body to be seen with the naked eye of course and some have wondered where have the names of the days come from? How do they originate? And the answer to that is very simple. During the time of the Roman era, the Caesar commanded a group to name the days of the week because up until that time, all through Bible times, they had been numbered. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, sixth day, sometimes called the day of preparation, the day to get ready for the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, of course. But during the Roman era, they wanted names for them. And so this group was commissioned, and they decided that they would name the days of the week in a descending order from the heavenly bodies seen with the naked eye. 
And beginning with the largest heavenly body, they would name the first day of the week, and that, of course, is sun. And what's the second largest heavenly body we see with the naked eye? The moon, moon day, and right on down the line to Saturn day. Saturday. I'm going to read you one more quotation quickly. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You won't find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The Bible endorses the religious observance of Saturday, a day that we Catholics never sanctify. Cardinal Given, Faith of Our Fathers, page 111. Another one briefly from the same source. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change from Saturday to Sunday was her act. It couldn't have been otherwise, as no one in those t days and times would have thought of doing anything in matters religious or ecclesiastic without her. And this change is a mark of our ecclesiastical power and authority in these religious matters. End of quotation. I was working in the Deep South, and I had preached about the Lord's Day being Saturday. And coming to my meeting was a young family new to Jesus' faith, new to Christianity, and really on fire. And so after hearing this sermon, they went to their pastor and asked him about it. And you remember we've mentioned that. I've had a lot of folks do that in the interim. Well, I'm going to go ask my preacher what he, what he thinks about you, what you've said. And, and instead of, uh, of asking the preacher about the, instead of checking the Bible out by the preacher, we ought to check the preacher out by the Bible. That's what we ought to do. But in any event, they came back with two or three scriptures and, and like it was brand new light, you know. And then I said, well, um, I I've seen those before. So they wrote to one of the most prominent televangelists who shall at this point remain nameless. You know, you can hardly say anything anymore without getting sued. Did you know that? Did you ladies and gentlemen know that preachers are now being sued just like doctors for malpractice? Yeah, someone will come and say, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I, I'm having a little problem with my wife. You know, she this or that. And, and preachers end up in court charged with malpractice for alienation of affection and, and all other kinds of strange things. Well, Christians wouldn't do that to one another. But in any event... This was a scripture that, um, that I confronted early in my ministry. And I want you to turn with me, if you will, please, to Acts chapter 20. And we're going to notice several of these passages now that have been used through the years in really kind of a feeble effort to try to show Sunday sacredness or Sunday holiness or the early church worshiping on Sunday. All right? I'm going to begin to read now at verse 7, Acts chapter 20, and we shall read down through to the end of verse 14. Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, ready to leave the next morning. And he continued his preaching until midnight. And by the way, there have been those who felt I have the same problem as Apostle Paul. I preach too long sometimes. You must forgive me. Someone said preachers oftentimes fall in love with the sounding of their own voices. Dear old HMS Richards, whom I shall love as long as I have a mind, said to me early in my ministry, Remember, Lyle, a sermon doesn't have to be eternal to be immortal. <laughs> but Paul was long in preaching. He continued to preach until midnight. There were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there was sitting in the window a certain young man by the name of Eutychus. He was fallen into a deep sleep because of the long preaching. And he was sunk down with sleep and he fell down from the third loft and was killed. Paul went down and fell upon him and embraced him and said, Trouble not yourself, his life is in him. And when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread again and eaten and talked for a long while, even till the break of day, he departed. And they brought the young man up alive and weren't just a little comforted. And then the 13th verse, Then we went with him down to the ship. And we, we went to the ship and sailed around to Asos, intending there to meet Paul, for he had decided to walk. And he met us there in Asos, and we came together again. Now, this is the context. Paul is preaching, and he preaches until midnight. And, and the room was lighted. The lights were all on on the first day of the week. Now, I'm not trying to deny in any sense that this is not a Sunday meeting. It is. Indeed it is. The context is abundantly clear. 
And now let me ask you a question before we go further. In the Bible, one day begins and the other ends when? At midnight? No, that came from the Romans. From sunset to sunset. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32. From sunset to sunset shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Mark chapter 2 and verse 30, I believe it is, or 32. And even when the sun did set. In the very beginning, Genesis 1. The evening and the morning were the first day. Evening and the morning were the second day. And so in the Bible, one day begins and the other day ends at sunset, not at midnight. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is according to our calendar, Saturday. But when the sun set here in the western sky, what day is it now according to the Bible? What day is it right now according to the Bible? This is Sunday. All right? This is instead of a Saturday night meeting, according to the Bible, this is a Sunday meeting. Are you with me? Now, the point is this. You would assume that if the folks were meeting in honor of the resurrection, if they were meeting because there had been a change from Saturday to Sunday, you would have expected they would have met in the morning at the time of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus or, or morning worship. Not so. But others have further said, well, they're breaking bread together. That means that they're celebrating the Lord's Supper. We don't have time to do it, but I want you folks to put down in your notes, please, Acts chapter 2, down at the end of the chapter, around verse 40 and following there, it says of the early Christian church that they met together and broke bread together every single day. Now, folks, if breaking bread makes a day holy, how many days of the week are holy days? Every one of them. They in the Middle East still today don't have, you know, we have a saying, it's the most popular thing since sliced bread. Well, they don't think sliced bread is so popular over the Middle East. Their bread still today is like a pancake, pita bread we oftentimes call it. And still today, the host of the meal rips the bread apart and passes it around. It's called breaking bread. And so instead of having communion in church on Sunday, the context is quite clear that they were having a fellowship lunch. And Paul continued to preach, and, and, and it was breakfast time, and they now had fellowship breakfast. And by the way, that's the way I really prefer to refer to it when we eat together at church and, and everyone brings a covered dish. Please, please don't call it potluck. That sounds to me a little bit like gambling at the casino. You're taking some kind of a chance on tow main. fellowship lunch <sighs> candles were lighted and and they ate together and then when the daylight came instead of worshiping Paul took off and hiked to Azos ladies and gentlemen that is a distance of 18 miles I have been there and the other folks weren't as well up on their jogging and so they said you know we got on the boat and rode over and there we met Paul when the Sun came up on Sunday morning Paul got up and went to work from time to time, some folk will ask me, well, Lyle, why do you work on Sunday? And by the way, when I live in and around the cities, and I'm in the cities, I'm very careful not to go out of my way to work on Sunday. I don't mow the lawn or, or start a chainsaw when my neighbors are, are either studying or, or in the church nearby me. I respect their feelings. I try to do that. But sometimes when they ask, why do you work on Sunday? I'll reply by saying to them, because Jesus did. And he's my example. In the beginning, he's our creator. We said that last night. Uh, the evening and the morning were the first day. He started the week. He began his job on Sunday. Jesus, my creator, worked on Sunday. And then he came to the time of redemption. And he was crucified on Friday. And he rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. And on Sunday morning, he got up and went back to work. How about that? And so sometimes I simply answer by saying I work on Sunday because Jesus did. Well, folks have said to me, um, seems to me, though, that the apostles, they changed the day. They must have changed the day. You know, we alluded to it last night and are going to do it again tonight. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8, it says there, when Jesus gave them rest, and, and I'm paraphrasing for you now. You'll go home and read it carefully in your Bibles. It says, when Jesus gave them rest, wouldn't he not have afterwards spoken of another day? You read that at verse 9. There remains, therefore, this day of rest, talking about the Saturday Sabbath and using it as an example of the peace that we find when we come into fellowship with our Lord and with His people. Now, while this one passage from Acts chapter 20 has been used again and again and again to try to show folks worshiping on Sunday, we're going to look at the actual record, and we're going to do that beginning in chapter 13 of the book of Acts. So find your way there, if you will, please, right now. Acts chapter 13, and we're going to begin at the 14th verse. <clears throat> now, while we're turning to Acts 
this passage, chapter 13. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that the book of Acts is a history. It is the history of the first 40 years of the Christian church. Yeah, a little less, but the first 30 years to be more precise. A history of the first 30 years of Christianity. And so this one passage from chapter 20 has been used to try to show Paul is keeping Sunday. Let's look at the actual record. Chapter 13, verse 14. It says, when we left that place, we went over into Antioch in Pisidia, and there we went into the synagogue on which day? On the Sabbath day, all right? Now, let's notice at verse 42. When the Jews were going to, oh, let me pause here for just a moment. There have been many who said, well, sure, Paul went into the synagogue on Saturday. Sure, he, went, he was the apostle to Gentiles, and, 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 but he also had a burden for the Jews. And so he would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath to try to tell them to come to church the next morning. Thin soup, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, let's read again. Verse 42. When the Jews had left the synagogue, the Gentiles asked that these same words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And then you drop down to verse 44. And the next Sabbath, the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Jews, Gentiles, everybody. We find the Apostle Paul keeping the Saturday Sabbath here. Now we go over to chapter 15 and we notice verse 21. Chapter 15, 21. Moses of old time, as in every city, those that preach him uh, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now, chapter 17, verse 2. Chapter 17, the book of Acts, and verse, well, let's back up chapter 16. Shall we do that? Verse 13 of chapter 16, firstly. All right? Chapter 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out by the side of the river where prayer was being made, and we sat down and we spoke with the women who were gathered there. It seems obvious according to the context that where there was no church, Paul would worship out in nature. And some of you folks enjoy that in the summertime and, and maybe in the wintertime as well. It's great to get out into nature on the Sabbath day. Chapter 17 and verse 2, Paul, as his manner was, went into them three Sabbaths and reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Let's go further, shall we? Chapter 18, Acts chapter 18 and the fourth verse about the Apostle Paul. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And you drop down there to about verse 11. It says he continued there for a year and six months preaching the Word of God every Sabbath in that one place for a year and a half. The Apostle Paul kept the Sabbath. Now we're going to go, you and I, over to chapter 24. And here it really gets good. Chapter 24 and verse 14. Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. I confess to you, by the way, this is the Apostle Paul defending himself before Tertullus, the orator. He's giving answer for his faith. I confess unto you that by the way that some call heresy, so also I worship the God of my fathers, believing all the things that are written in the law and in the prophets. Now, Paul couldn't say that at the end of his life if he were keeping Sunday or suggesting others do it. He said, I still practice everything that's written in the law and in the prophets as well. And then finally, chapter 28 in the 17th verse, just hours probably before his own death, he makes this statement. Chapter 28 and verse 17. Acts chapter 28, verse 17. It came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered a prisoner from Jerusalem to the hands of the Romans. I've done nothing, he said, against the teachings and the customs of the Jewish forefathers. He couldn't say that if he was somehow promoting Sunday, keeping Sunday worship. Next, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, ladies and gentlemen, chapter 16, and it's been used again over and over and over by folks, preachers, televangelists who try to defend this idea of the early church keeping Sunday. And we're going to see that it just is not theologically sound. Acts chapter 16, we're going to begin at the very first verse. And while you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of the context. What is happening is that there is a famine over in the area of Jerusalem. These folks over there are starving to death. And Paul is on a mission journey in Asia Minor. And word comes to the Apostle Paul about the plight of Christians. And so he sends runners ahead down the main highway from here, Asia Minor, over to Jerusalem. And they're carrying a message with them. And they're stopping at the churches that Paul has raised up. 
and they're saying, look, Paul is coming. There's a crisis in Jerusalem. The saints are starving. Paul is going to be taking up a purse. And, and, and when he gets here, he doesn't have time to do a fundraising campaign. He can't go around knocking on doors. Look, you have that done so that when he arrives, he'll be able to just take the money and hurry on over to Jerusalem. Chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the first verse. Now, according to the collect, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the church of Galatia, you do as well. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered, so there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever you approve by your letters, them I, I may bring with me to take your liberalities on to Jerusalem. And if it be right that they go, uh, they may go with me. And I'm going to be passing through Macedonia and so forth. Paul said, look... Lay some money aside. Now, to try to use this passage to show folks in church uh, passing the offering plates down the pews is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. You do, I challenge you, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any scholarly background at all, I challenge you to go to the original language and, or even to some of the more modern translations and read this passage there, and some of them are this explicit. The Apostle Paul is saying, let each of you set aside something at home. In the storehouse, I was holding meetings in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We had a little bit of a question and answer session one night after the meeting, and this passage came up. And there was a young man in a remote corner that waved his arm, and eventually I recognized him. And he stood up, and he said, I am from the Middle East. And he said, I would like to share with you what I think Paul may be saying. Now, I want to go on record to say to you folks, this isn't from the Bible, but this was from a young man whose roots went back hundreds and hundreds of years into the customs and the practices of the Holy Land, the Bible Land. He said over in the Bible Lands and in the areas that Paul was passing through, a person worked a week, and then the first day of the following week, he was paid for the past week's work. He said, what I think Paul may be saying is that as soon as you get your check, take out something and set it aside. Now, again, the Bible doesn't say that. But at the same time, it certainly doesn't say the folks were in church passing offering plates. Not at all. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And we need to turn there, folks. We alluded to it last night. Uh, But it's of necessity that tonight we take the time to read some of these verses. Revelation chapter 12 and the last verse of that chapter, the 17th verse. Revelation 12, 17, this is the passage about the great red dragon that does violence to God's people and and tries to destroy Jesus Christ as soon as he comes to planet earth as a baby. It says in the last verse there, the dragon was angry against the woman of the church and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And then it tells us why he's so upset. What angers him so? It says because they keep the commandments of God and have also the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going over to chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to read verse 12. In the verses prior, as we alluded last night, you find those who've received the mark of the beast because of their choices, because of their um, decision to follow this authority instead of the authority of God and His Word. And they received the mark of the beast. And then, in sudden contrast, you find God's people, and they're described in verse 12, chapter 14. Here are the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have also the faith of Jesus Christ. And then we go to the last chapter of the last book, It's not the last book by accident, of course. It's for those who live in the very last days. And we're going to read verse 14. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. Blessed are they that do the commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates inside the city. And so we find these three passages where those that are alive to meet Jesus in peace are found as keeping all ten of the commandments. They're not satisfied with the discounted Decalogue. They don't want, uh, you know, 90% of God's will. They want it all. In the first of Genesis, we find a world perfect and beautiful and lovely. In the middle of this perfect planet is a garden. Plants and flowers and trees and shrubs and animals. And in the middle of the garden, 
we find our parents, Adam and Eve. God says, this is to be your eternal home. Live it up. Train the vines. Name the animals. I'll come by and visit with you. Then you come to chapter 3 and you find our old enemy, the devil, coming and he tempts our parents and they fail the test and they have to be driven from the garden. And we're once they're invited to eat freely of the fruit of the tree of life for the healing of the nations, for their continued well-being. Now they're prevented from even entering the garden, let alone eating from the fruit. They've lost it all and death becomes a reality. Then we move through the Bible to the Revelation, the last book, and we move through the last book to the last three chapters, and what do we find? God is recreating planet Earth as it was in its Edenic beauty, perhaps even more lovely. The meek promised Jesus in Matthew 5 and verse 5 shall inherit the earth once made new. And there is the garden, and in the middle of the garden there is the tree of life. And where folks were forbidden in Genesis from coming to eat, now they're welcomed. Welcome home, children eat and live forever everything that is lost in the first three chapters of genesis because of sin is restored in the last three chapters of revelation because of grace thank god for jesus the nails in his hands could his law be set aside he need not have died but because his because his law was perfect and just and righteous he paid the price. He took our place. I, said the poet, should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. and I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. If you love Him, keep His commandments. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the clarity of Your Word. You love us so very much that you long ago made provision for our frailties and our faults. Because our parents slipped and fell, you came and lived the perfect life in our place. On a life we never lived, on a death we never died, on a resurrection that we did not deserve, we hang our only hope of eternity. Thank you, dear Jesus. In your name, amen.